Welcome everyone tonight to this event at the LSE. My name is Minou Shafiq and I'm the director of the London School of Economics and Political Science. Uh, and I am very pleased today to be here to welcome David Cole and Philippe Sands uh, for this discussion this evening. Uh, let me briefly introduce both of them and then I'll introduce the topic. Uh, David Cole is the ACLU's national legal director. The ACLU, as many of you will know, the American Civil Liberties Union, is the US's largest and oldest civil liberties organization. Uh, in that capacity, David directs a program of approximately 1,400 state and federal lawsuits on a wide range of civil liberties issues. He manages the ACLU's legal team as well as its Supreme Court docket and the huge number of staff attorneys working in all 50 states on its issues. Prior to that, he was a law professor at Georgetown University where he taught constitutional law uh, and has litigated a large number of Supreme Court cases. We're also fortunate to have Philippe Sands, who is more local. He is professor of law and director of the Center on International Courts and Tribunals in the Faculty of Law at University College London. He is a frequent writer and commentator on radio, television, uh, films, etc. lectures around the world. Uh, and when he isn't doing that, he is a practicing barrister and has an extensive litigated, litigation practice and has appeared before the International Court of Justice, the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea, uh, the International Center for the Settlement of Investment Disputes, and the European Court of Justice. And our topic for this evening is defending liberal liberty and democracy in the age of Trump, the role of civil society. And uh, what we're going to try and do is have David start us off to talk about populism, the legal system, and how civil society is responding in the US to the challenges brought by the Trump administration. And then I'll ask Philippe to explore some parallels with the UK, and in particular in light of Brexit. And then we'll try and step back and talk about the wider, have a wider discussion about populism, the law, constitutional traditions, and what it means for the future. So, for those of you who are on Twitter, the hashtag for tonight's event is hashtag LSE Trump. Uh, <laughs> anyway, um, and I'll ask you to turn your phones uh, onto silent, and after the lecture, I will open it up to questions from the audience. So let's get started. So I am going to uh, give you that one. Yeah, yeah. Perfect. I'm going to start with you, David. Uh, I know uh, I know that you took this job on uh, before Trump was elected, and you were happily going into the ACLU, thinking you were going to continue to advance the progressive legal agenda that had uh, up until then been been what it had focused on. And obviously, uh, the job changed enormously after the Trump election. So tell us a little bit about how the ACLU has responded to Trump's election uh, and how the priorities have changed as a result of that. So sure. For, um, first of all, thanks for uh, having me. I'm, d I'm uh, uh, delighted to be here. And uh, thanks to all of you for coming. If this many people are uh, interested in defending liberty in the age of Trump, I think we can do it. Uh, <laughs> Um, I, you know, I, I, did, I did sign on to um, be the legal director of the ACLU in the summer of 2016. Uh, and if you think back to the summer of 2016, it was a different world. I was actually encouraged to apply for the job by the executive director who said to me, uh, David, how can you not take this job? You have been practicing constitutional law, writing about constitutional law, teaching constitutional law, for 35 years under a conservative majority Supreme Court. Just think what it'd be like to lead the ACLU under a liberal majority Supreme Court. And because at that time, summer of 2016, we all thought Hillary Clinton would win. In fact, Donald Trump thought Hillary Clinton would win. Uh, and she would, of course, ap um, appoint Justice Scalia's uh, replacement. And 
uh, and we would be off to the races. And so I signed on the bottom line, uh, did not put in any conditional what if uh, clause because there was no what if. Uh, uh, I, I then uh, had my folks at the ACLU within their respective project uh, uh, expertises uh, write up memos on how with a liberal majority Supreme Court for the first time in 40 years, we haven't had a liberal majority Supreme Court for 40 years, uh, how we could advance uh, various doctrines and in what ways uh, we could do that. And, uh, and then, uh, then November 8th uh, happened uh, and, and the job obviously changed uh, uh, entirely dramatically. And uh, we are in a defensive mode as opposed to an affirmative mode. Um, we are uh, suing the president, um, but that's not really different from what we've done under prior administrations. We sued the Obama administration. We sued the Clinton administration. We, that's what we do. We sue the president when the president violates constitutional rights. It's just that um, there was a sense that Trump would, would be violating many more constitutional rights and norms, and that sense has proved to be true, and so we are more active. I think our latest count is 186 legal actions against the Trump administration since he took office, which is about two a week. Uh, so, um, uh, but, but, but I will say that um, the, 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 for me, the silver lining to this do otherwise dark period is how the American people have responded. And, uh, and, and you see that in lots of ways. You see that in the Women's March, probably the single large, may, maybe, maybe with the possible exception of the, war, the, the march against the Iraq war, the, the, uh, the largest march in uh, American history. Uh, uh, put together within, with, with two months' notice. I mean, incredible. And uh, the, the people who came out to demonstrate against the Muslim ban, uh, uh, the, the weekend that that was uh, issued, going to airports across the country, the, the Me Too movement, which I think is attributable to Donald Trump. I mean, women have been sexually assaulted, sexually harassed for since um, there were men and women, as far as I, uh, as far as I um, uh, can tell. And, and yet it was only when we had a president who was an avowed sexual assaulter uh, that, the, that the movement took off. Um, we have had mass shootings in the United States uh, all too often, uh, but it was only in the Trump administration that the Parkland High School shooting launched a national movement uh, run by high school students uh, to, to, to push back on, on gun control. And we at the ACLU have seen that, a similar uh, thing in that our membership at the ACLU uh, went from 400,000 people before uh, I started working for the ACLU uh, to uh, 1.6 million members. Now, I can't really take credit for that uh, uh, quadrupling of membership. My father joined. I can take credit for that one. But I think Donald Trump gets the rest of them. He but does. But, uh, but it's, you know, that, that's a sign that, um, that, that Americans are uh, concerned about what this man stands for and, are, and want to respond by, uh, um, by engaging politically and standing up for civil liberties and civil rights. Um, and, and to me, that, uh, that has, has been the most, the, the silver lining, and that has, is what has guided us as we have uh, sort of, you know, um, transformed ourselves in response to this quadrupling of size, significant increase in resources, and a significant increased threat. So the, the, there are many threats to civil liberties at the moment. Immigration, voting rights, abortion, the rule of law, the enforcement of civil rights, the erosion of the administrative states, and the threat to the civil service. Which ones are you most worried about? Uh, that's like saying, which of your children are your favorites? <laughs> um, you know, they're, they're, we, we, cover the, we cover the waterfront and, and, and we are, you know, we have a, a religious freedom project, we have a women's rights project, we have a reproductive freedom project, but we do, and so we care about all of these uh, rights, but we do make priorities uh, in response to perceived threats. And I would say since Trump was elected, at least in the, um, in the legal department, but also I would say in the advocacy and the public education department, um, uh, immigrants' rights, voting rights, uh, and reproductive freedom are the sort of three, um, the, the, th the, the three centerpieces um, because that's where Trump has 
uh, has focused his efforts, the, you know, because he is uh, using immigrants as a, as a demagogue does, um, uh, and very aggressively. And so we've we've uh, been very involved in the. We filed the first Muslim ban lawsuit. Um, we filed the family separation uh, lawsuit, which ended the the inhuman policy of forcibly separating children from their mothers and fathers in order to deter people from coming to the United States. Uh, we have sued over the revocation of DACA, which is a form of legalization that Obama extended to um, uh, young people who are undocumented, who came here you know, through no fault of their own. Uh, their parents brought them here. Um, uh, we've sued over detention of uh, foreign nationals, which uh, Trump is detaining in vast numbers, again, to try to deter people from coming. Uh, uh, reproductive freedom, because Trump promised to overturn Roe versus Wade, which is the uh, Supreme Court decision that protects a woman's right to choose to uh, have, a, have a child or not um, uh, when she is pregnant. Um, uh, and, and states have seen that, and so the states, the red states in particular, the Republican-leaning states, have been very aggressive in passing very restrictive abortion laws, and we are in, uh, you know, in, in, in state after state challenging those. And then voting rights, the, um, you know, the, the Republican uh, Party, and I should say we are a nonpartisan organization, the ACLU. We are not the Democratic Party. We are committed to the principles of the Constitution, and we protect them on behalf of people with whom we agree, and we protect them on behalf of people with whom we disagree. So we represented the Nazis marching in Skokie. We represented the white supremacists in Charlottesville. We represent, we were currently in a, uh, on the side of the NRA in a battle that it's having with uh, Governor uh, of New York, Andrew Cuomo. Um, so we're not, uh, um, we are nonpartisan, but uh, one of the things that the Republican Party, I think, has done is seeing the demographics of the United States changing and seeing from the polls that the demographics of, uh, of change are driving the, will drive the country to the left uh, over time rather than adjust and adapt its policies to reflect the changing polity. polity uh, they have chosen to engage in voter suppression, and voter suppression that targets the poor, uh, the young, uh, and people of color, because they are the people who are most likely to vote uh, against the Republicans. And so we are committed to voting rights, and so we've been, we, we've been we're in Georgia, uh, uh, we're in uh, North Dakota, we're in Kansas, uh, right now challenging voter suppression uh, methods in those places. Say something, David, before I turn to you about the courts and what's happened to the courts, federal judges, the Supreme Court, and what that means for civil liberties. Well, so that's a huge topic, and I want to make sure Philippe gets a word in edgewise. But I mean, our, you know, our, our court, I mean, on the one hand, um, I think the courts are an incredibly important bulwark for civil liberties. They have to be. Uh, that is one of their reasons for being. Um, and, uh, and, and that is one of our tools. So, you know, when two days after Trump was elected, we took out full page ads in the, in the New York Times and the Washington Post saying to President Trump, we'll see you in court. Uh, and so, essentially saying, if you do the things that you're, you promised during the campaign that we've already identified as unconstitutional, we will sue you. And we have. We've sued him over the Muslim ban, the family separation, transgender military ban, barring young women. Uh, from, from uh, access to abortion when they're in uh, federal custody, holding a uh, U.S. citizen uh, as an enemy combatant without charges uh, for almost a year in, uh, in Iraq. Uh, the, the voter suppression uh, commission we sued over, now they're seeking to add a question about citizenship to the census, which is designed to drive immigrants not to answer the census, which then has tremendous implications both for voting power and for, uh, for government benefits. So we are suing him and the courts, I would say by and large, the courts have been, uh, we've won most of our cases in the lower courts. People probably know we lost the Muslim ban in the Supreme Court and it doesn't really matter if you win in the lower courts if you lose in the Supreme Court. Although he was forced to modify the ban 
twice and make it less, uh, uh, far less uh, sweeping and, uh, than it was. But, but I, that, that was the law. So I, so I think, um, I think on the one hand, the courts have been doing a, a pretty good job. I don't think the courts for the, I think courts tend to be conservative, but tend to be establishment conservative, and Trump is not establishment conservative. Uh, and, uh, but he is also uh, probably the most lasting thing he will do, other than I hope galvanize the left, <laughs> uh, is uh, appoint uh, justices and judges, and, and, and he, has done, he has been very aggressive about that uh, and has appointed some very, very conservative uh, judges and justices, and that has, has led us to um, uh, look to other forums for, our, for the defense of liberty, um, and, and, and we have um, launched a, a whole grassroots mobilization uh, effort, and we are engaged in the elections like we never have been before, um, seeking to use all the tools available to us to defend liberty, including uh, the democratic process. And you know, I think that would have been the right thing to do even if Trump had not been elected. I think you know, the, the most effective defense of liberty are the people, uh, not the institutions. Uh, and, and so uh, a, a civil liberties organization has to engage the people, um, uh, but all the more so when uh, President Trump is putting people on the courts who may not do the job that they're supposed to do. Okay, thank you. Let me turn to Philippe, and you can react to some of the things David has said, but I'd also like you to talk a little bit about the UK, and in particular, how the legal system in the UK has coped with the rise of populism, Brexit, attacks on judges, and all the legal issues that the Brexit process has thrown up. Sure. Well, it's incredibly nice to be here with you, Anoush, and with David, and here at the LSE in this wonderful place. I mean, as you know, my background is in the international law side rather than the domestic law side. So that's my angle, just beginning on what David has said about Trump. And looking, you, you focused essentially and rightly for the ACLU on the domestic. Uh, and it has been, as someone who is married to an American and travels often to the United States, incredibly invigorating to see what the response has been. I compare a sort of energy right now in the United States, on all sides, frankly, compared to this sort of slightly downbeat, rather sad sense that the United Kingdom has as it sleepwalks into who knows what. I mean, less than six months from Brexit, we have no idea between hard Brexit and leaving with no deal to remaining in the EU indefinitely and anything in between. It is astonishing. But it is on the international side that most of what Trump has done touches my activities. So a lot of people look at what the Trump administration is doing and think, it's mad, it's mayhem, it's bonkers. It's none of those things. There is a clear agenda and there is a clear plan underway. What is going on is that the Trump administration is systematically dismantling the institutional arrangements that were put in place after 1945 to create a world based on the idea of multilateralism and the rule of law. And it's the common theme, whether it is the Iran nuclear deal, whether it is the climate change convention, whether it is blocking um, the efforts to appoint new members of the WTO appellate body which seems like a completely arcane and ridiculous thing to do, but has the effect that within a year, there will be insufficient members of the appellate body, it will not be quarate, and it won't be able to do anything. It's not, it's, it, it, it is designed. If you take the NAFTA, the idea, or the formerly called NAFTA, although it may yet continue to be called NAFTA, depending on what happens in the midterm elections, it, it illustrates very simply what is going on. It is to replace a tripartite regional legal arrangement in which the US has to negotiate simultaneously with Canada and Mexico with two bilateral arrangements. That is the plan. And that is the plan across the board. It's why they're not signing the Trans-Pacific Partnership. It's why they're dealing individually with Korea, Malaysia, Japan, on the theory that bilaterally they are more powerful and more effective. 
So that is the context in which I come to your question about what's happening in the United Kingdom and the Brexit angle on this. Because the United Kingdom faces a fundamental difficulty. If the United Kingdom leaves the EU, and it remains an if, it will have at some point to renegotiate or to negotiate new international trade agreements across a range of issues. And to understand the silence of the British government on the many excesses of the Trump administration, you need to think of only three words, free trade agreement. The British government is desperate, desperate to have a free trade agreement with the United States as soon as it can, and it will do nothing to alienate mm. or limit that possibility. That explains why, across the board, on all of these issues, there are low-level, informal expressions of regret, but nothing beyond that. On Khashoggi, for example, the British government, at level of Prime Minister and Foreign Secretary, said nothing for two weeks, even after the United States had spoken through Pompeo, Secretary of State, and the President. Absolute silence. Why? Because they know this is a particularly dangerous moment. Uh, in term for Trump, actually, and that more will emerge, I think, uh, in relation to that. Yesterday, we had the remarkable spectacle of the Foreign Secretary giving evidence to the British Parliament and explaining why uh, Yemen had to continue to be bombed indiscriminately for the foreseeable future, whilst at the same time, completely unbeknown to the Foreign Office, President Trump had called for a ceasefire within 30 days. In other words, they hadn't even bothered to tell the British what is going on. That is the relationship between the United Kingdom and the United States. So to understand the mindset of 10 Downing Street right now, what is staring Mrs. May in the face is the fear that the United Kingdom will leave the European Union will have to negotiate all sorts of arrangements and will be utterly dependent on negotiating a free trade agreement first and foremost with the United States as he rips up all other trade agreements. I mean, it's a sort of insanity, you know, it's a sort of suspended uh, cognitive dissonance as, you know, it's as though they don't want to see what is happening over there because it has such dreadful implications for over here. So it's that sense of silence in this country at the governmental level as to what's going on that is so problematic and so troubling. Mm. And where, I mean, as you said, predicting anything at the moment is impossible. So I'm not going to ask you to predict will there be a second referendum or are we going to crash out? But where, um, where does this take the, the international system which, in which the UK has operated and thrived, frankly, for decades? Uh, does it, you know, is the, you imply it's a sort of, you know, the UK either becomes de facto the 51st state or, uh, or stays in the European fold. Is that the choice? I, I, I mean, in a, in a nutshell, if you go back, I mean, the entire international order that we have today was constructed in the period of about a year in 1945. It was an extraordinary moment. And it was a moment led by the United States and the United Kingdom, with a large number of other countries participating. But essentially, that was what drove the system through, based upon a little piece of paper called the Atlantic Charter, that Churchill and Roosevelt signed mm -hmm. in the spring of 1941 that laid out a framework for what would happen once the war had been won, if it was won. The remarkable thing 75 years later is that those two countries have withdrawn effectively from the system that they created. Trump has withdrawn because he has taken the decision, surrounded by people like Pompeo and John Bolton, that they're better off with a vast bilateralized system. I mean, the logic of where he's going is, and I think it's not impossible that it would happen, is that within the next 18 months, the Trump administration actually says, we're leaving the United Nations. I don't think that's impossible. 
because he's going to say to himself, why do we have to put up with this rubbish? Why do we have to deal with these people in the Security Council? We're better off on our own. We're better off just dealing with things bilaterally. So the US goes off in one direction, and the UK is left hoping that somehow there'll be a relationship with the United States. But, but here is the terrible, painful truth. The US does not give a toss about the United Kingdom <laughs> under President Trump. And I saw that absolutely firsthand when I saw what happened when there was a straight-off race for the election of a judge at the International Court of Justice between a British candidate and an Indian candidate. And the Indian candidate won. What is not widely known is that it is the Trump administration and Nikki Haley, the American ambassador, who pulled the plug on the British candidate, a distinguished former professor of international law of this university. Because, frankly, at the end of the day, India is more important to a Trump administration than Britain. So the reality that we're going to somehow emerge out there uh, and, and remake the world along the United States is just a complete nonsense. The bigger question is, since nature and the law abhor a vacuum, is who steps in. Because we're beginning to see the signs of who begins to step in. So, of course, one possibility is that some sort of struggling along fortified European Union steps in. At this point, it's hard to see, but it's not impossible. And Germany is hugely important. How ironic, incidentally, that in 2018 we look to Germany, which had 21 defendants in the dock in 1945, the time I've most written, recently written about, mm. as the flag holder and bastion for liberal democracy and the rule of law. But I think the real players, and this is where the Trump administration's ire is particularly directed, is China. And China's engagement with the international system is fascinating. It is not black and white. It's very, very complex. On the one hand, in a case that I was involved in, the South China Seas, they don't participate. There are certain issues, national sovereignty, national territory. We don't do rule of law on those kinds of issues. But which country is filling the gap? on trade, on foreign investment, on international financial services. On climate. On climate. It's China. It's China. And so the, the structures are changing. And I fear that the United Kingdom, led right now by a coterie of individuals who are absolutely clueless about what's going on in the world and who somehow feel we can go back to Commonwealth 2.0 in the glories <laughs> of the 1930s, they are going to have to sit down and they're going to have to negotiate a trade agreement with China, a trade agreement with the United States, a trade agreement with Russia, a trade agreement with India, a trade agreement with the whole of Africa to replace what used to be called Lome, and they are going to realize the UK does not have a lot to offer. That's what they should have learned with the EU over the last two years, but they're taking away from it a different lesson. So I'm pretty anxious about where this country is headed. So I, 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 I guess my question is whether the, what's, what's at stake are this set of institutional arrangements post the post post World War II order, and um, you know one one possible v uh, view of what might happen is that those arrangements, uh, as unpopular as they are with some uh, parts of the electorate here uh, and in the U.S., are actually necessary for uh, the world to, 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 to move forward and are stronger than any particular moment. And so um, Brexit may, you may go through with Brexit and then may have to in one form or another essentially re-engage re uh, with Europe because how else do you survive? And in the US, Trump has two more years uh, and he may well be uh, voted out of office uh, very uh, strongly, and I'll, I'm happy to talk about why I think that, in 2020. And then we have uh, someone who's come into, uh, come into office and a party that has come into office across the board that has a very different view about international relations and seeks to repair those um, fissures. And with you know, China and Russia being the, uh, the alternatives, the, the, the rest of the world may, may be okay with, with that, uh, with sort of rebuilding the institutions. And so, I, you know, I, it, it could also go downhill very fast, but do you have any confidence, I guess, in the ability of these institutions and the, 
economic forces that drove these institutions to come to, to, come to play in the first place, uh, overcoming Brexit and Trump. I think, there's, I think there's another problem, though, in the U.S., which is that the, the U.S. always underwrote the system, and the U.S. public always had the view that the net benefits to the U.S. of the system was worth the costs in terms of having a global military footprint and having the dollar underwrite the international trading system. It feels like the U.S. public's view that that deal is worth it has changed. Well, hence the, you know, the rest of the world is ripping us off and we need to restore our sovereignty and be able to throw our weight around globally. It feels like that at least there's a strand of public opinion in the U.S. that has moved. I don't know what you think, Philippe. But. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. I mean, one of the great things about, I've known David for many years, we are close friends. And one of the things that is invigorating of being around David, and it is truly fantastic, is this perennial optimism. <laughs> However terrible it looks, we'll ring him up, you know, in the middle of the cavern or stuff and say, ah, oh, you know, what's going on? Explain to us behind the scenes, maybe there are things we don't know about. And, and he always finds that light that comes through the cracks and allows us to feel. And, 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 and you and I, David, have talked a lot, because in a sense, this is a discussion about comparative institutional strengths, because I, I would throw back to you, what about the Supreme Court? What about the US Constitution? Is the US Constitution robust enough to withstand what appears to be coming. I mean, the Trump magic has let something out of the bag, and things that could not be said are now being said, as is happening also in this country. Mm -hmm. You are better placed than I to answer that question, and I'd really actually be interested to know from you, you know, whether that sort of Philip Roth type of scenario of things just spiraling out of control is absolutely possible. As far as the international institutional structure is concerned, is I'm really torn about this. So I, I was involved in a hearing a month ago at the International Court of Justice uh, involving an obscure territorial area called the British Indian Ocean Territory in the United Kingdom and called the Chagos Archipelago mm -hmm. in Mauritius and in many, well, all over Africa, actually. And here was an advisory opinion that came from the United Nations General Assembly asking the simple question, has the decolonization of Mauritius, started in 1968, been completed or not? In other words, does the UK hanging on to a bit of what used to be Mauritius interfere with the completion of the process of decolonization? And the process was extraordinary in many respects, but here was the single big takeaway from it. Dozens of countries that had never before participated before the International Court of Justice turned up to argue, point number one. So that's sort of interesting. They seem to have a faith that this is a place worth going to, that I was struck by. And interesting fact number two was not a single country in the world I'm going to say that again. Not a single country in the world defended the positions taken by the United Kingdom and the United States on the merits. <coughs> they were in a minority of two out of 200. And I had to, sitting there in court, I just thought, this is sort of astonishing what is going on. Mm. Uh, so that gives me a sense of optimism in this sense. Yeah. They're using the institutions. The institutions. Yeah. What we look for, of course, is the very interesting question of what the judges do. Did the judges take note that on one side of the table you have the United Kingdom and the United States, two founders of the United Nations and permanent members arguing one thing, and the rest of the world arguing something else, which way do they jump? Who knows? We'll wait and see. see. But that so, therein, yeah. I think, lies the answer to your question. So I think, I think, and I think therein lies the answer to your question about the Supreme Court. I mean, I, you know, some, one way of looking at the Supreme Court, Trump has had two appointments to the Supreme Court. He has cemented a very right-wing conservative majority for the rest of my career, um, not something I'm happy about. Um, but one of the things... Um, that, gi that, that, that gives me um, some solace in this is 
the, the fact that while the court is a counter-majoritarian institution and the justices have life tenure and they don't have to run for re-election and so they are, you know, in some sense free agents, uh, when you look historically at how the court has uh, resolved disputes in the United States, it has rarely departed very far from where the country is. Um, there really are two instances where it, was, where it did depart from where the country was, and in both instances it caused a tremendous uh, challenge to the legitimacy of the court and a, a kind of um, blowback uh, effect. One was when uh, in the, one is very relevant to this period of time, which is in the progressive era, when in response to the Gilded Age, the the first time that uh, you know, massive uh, disparities in, 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 uh, in wealth uh, arose in the United States. There was tremendous political pressure to, to respond democratically by curtailing the ability of businesses to screw uh, um, workers and uh, consumers. Uh, the court sided consistently with businesses. And in fact, that's when the ACLU was founded in 1920. And the first legal director of the ACLU uh, is quoted as saying, we can never expect justice from the courts. Because at that time, you know, you won't hear me say that, um, but, but at that time, you, you couldn't expect justice from the courts. The courts were entirely aligned with the, with the wealthy business interests and, and just getting in the way of where the rest of the country was going. That ended up in a major crisis of legitimacy for the court in the New Deal era, and the court reversed itself and let all those laws uh, um, go through. The second time the court was out of step with the American public, uh, in some sense, was in the opposite direction, the Warren Court, uh, the most liberal court that, the, that we've ever had in the history of the United States, the court that gave us Brown versus Board of Education and, uh, and extended, uh, d declared the death penalty unconstitutional for about four years uh, and, uh, uh, and, and extended uh, uh, whole sets of rights to criminal defendants uh, and the like. And, and that court too caused a tremendous backlash, an effort to impeach the Chief Justice uh, and ultimately a shift in the politics of the people who got elected and the court has now had 40 years of conservative majority, uh, a conservative majority. So I think that the lesson is the court can't depart too far from where the, uh, the country is. And if, as I think is, is likely, not certain by any means, but likely, uh, in 2020, we see a galvanized, uh, progressive uh, majority of citizens who care about civil liberties and civil rights and dignity and uh, maybe even international law uh, uh, vote in uh, uh, members of the Senate, the House, the President uh, who, who uh, care about those things and the country comes together in response to Trump. He, if, he, if he is the great unifier by, uh, by, you know, by his very divisiveness um, then I think the court will be limited in how much damage it can do. Now, so, so I think actually the, that's one of the reasons I was suggesting we at the ACLU have, have shifted uh, some of our resources from, you know, traditional litigation, which we still do and will always do, uh, to a, a more averted, aver, avertedly political strategy that seeks to mobilize people in defense of liberty because I think at the end of the day that is the single best protector. There's a quote that I um, often uh, uh, invoke by a, a judge named Learned Hand. Uh, he was, he's said to be the greatest federal judge never to sit on the Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. um, uh, in the last four or five years my wife was named a federal judge so I can't agree with that statement <laughs> any longer. She's not on the Supreme Court. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but he was a great judge, and he did have a great name, learned hand, for a judge. But he gave a speech in, in 1942 in uh, Central Park, and it was a, a naturalization ceremony for 150,000 newly naturalized citizens. Very different, you know, from today with the migrant caravan, right? Uh, and, and his speech was called The Spirit of Liberty, and he said in that, this is a judge, a federal judge, right? 
Um, he said in that speech, um, liberty lies in the hearts of men and women. When it dies there, no court, no constitution, no law can save it. When it lies there, it needs no court, no constitution, no law to save it. Now this is, like many great quotes, an overstatement. We need courts, we need constitution, we need laws. They remind us of our better selves. They hold us to our promises. But it recognizes a critically important truth, which is that the ultimate de de defenders of liberty have to be us. And so we, as an institution, have to engage the citizenry uh, around civil liberties and civil rights. And you know we've been doing that for 100 years. Donald Trump has, you know, ha has sort of underscored that for us in a way that nobody else has. And my hope is that that uh, you know, moves us forward in 2020 to a very different uh, kind of world. So, Philip, I'll let yeah, you say something, and then I'm going to ask the citizenry yeah. to speak. I mean, I mean, I mean, the, the points of comparison between these two countries right now, amongst others, is a deep sense of division and polarization, which may be connected to the fact that these are two countries which, in the OECD index, are ranked right at the top of countries in which divisions of wealth, in which inequality is the greatest. I've always had a sense that that is somehow connected. And of course, the big question that you pose is the role of law in healing or bridging yeah. those divisions, which mm. is a very complex question. Mm. But there is also politics to bridge those divisions. And one of the things that I found really striking in this country, coming back to a question that you posed, Manoush, is about what's going to happen with Brexit, is, is the extent to which the polarization has been enhanced. It has, it has not been bridged. And coming back to your question, here is one possibility. I mean, we have the sense that in the UK there is a sort of middle ground there that could construct a way of going forward in which the UK leaves the European Union but remains very close to it in terms of legal standards on a whole range of issues we care about, international trade agreements, and so on and so forth. And I suspect that in two and a half weeks' time, that is what's going to come out. I think there will be an agreement between the European Commission and the other member states and Mrs May's government. And then the fun will begin. She will come to Parliament. And in the last week of November, which is when it's going to happen very soon, there will be a series of votes. What happens if she is unable to get any of the options through Parliament? And Parliament does as it did in relation to uh, reform of the House of Lords, vote down everything. What actually happens then? And one possibility, of course, that is then evoked is that the Prime Minister goes to the country and says, this is the deal. I ask you to vote for this deal. And at that point, I think a lot of minds will be concentrated. Actually, if the deal is half OK, is that not better than the mayhem that may follow? if we really do leave without a deal. And you can begin to see the plates shifting right now. Some in the leadership of the Labour Party move, I suspect, towards the possibility of saying, actually, that is the lesser evil. So I, I, I can't answer your question, but I think we're on the cusp in this country in the next month of when the rubber hits the road and each of us in this room who participates in these issues will really have to ask ourselves long and difficult questions, actually. What is the solution that brings the greatest good to the most people in the country going forward? Okay. At that point, let me open it up for comments and questions. I'm going to take them three at a time. If you could introduce yourselves and preferably ask a question rather than a statement. Um, let's start with the, I need a woman. I'd like a woman. Sorry. We have a tradition at the LSC. We always start with a woman. How about the woman, the, the young woman behind? I'll come back to you. And then the woman in front, and then I'll turn to you. 
Hi, my name is Eden Siskin. Um, this is a question directed to David Cole. Thank you so much for being here. Um, the question is with, with regards to on Tuesday, President Trump's statement about birthright citizenship and taking that away. And I was curious if you could talk about the 14th Amendment and the possibilities of actually doing so. Okay, and then maybe you could pass to the person just in front of you and then the gentleman to the left. Do you want us to stand up? Do you want us to if stand up? If you would up? like, please go ahead. Hello, my name is Olatung Williams. I'm Nigerian and I'm visiting um, London. Um, you were talking about the, the very systematic uh, dismantling of the multilateral institutions and it's very scientific and he knows exactly what he's doing and I, I subscribe to that view very much. Um, if he were to succeed, just hypothetically, and if all the other um, global north leaders who feel the same way he does if they were to embark on that route, where would that leave Africa? Because I just have a feeling that we are extremely vulnerable in all of this. Thank okay, you. and the gentleman here. And then I'll come to this side of the room for the next round. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Paul Carroll, expatriate New Yorker, and uh, my question is to uh, David Cole. Uh, you said that the court almost never goes very far from where the country is. And looking at our country from this side of the ocean, it looks so split that I'd like your view on where the country is. Yes, that's a good question. <laughs> when, when you say that the court doesn't stray very far from it. Yeah, it's a very good question. And it's the same for the UK. David. All right. Uh, I'll take the first one first because it's easier. Um, yeah, there's a constitutional right to birthright citizenship and President Trump cannot take it away. Uh, I suspect that is a proposal that will die on Tuesday because it is uh, all about demagoguery uh, around the midterm elections. And once it has served its purpose, uh, uh, we will move on. But, um, uh, but I think it's unconstitutional. Um, a great question uh, as to where the country is. I think, you know, I, 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 I would say uh, that remains to be seen. Um, uh, very much remains to be seen. And one of the concerns I have about the way in which social media has affected the dialogue and the debate um, is the extent to which it has uh, become uh, a forum for tribalism uh, and has exacerbated those divisions. But, but let me just say this um, about why I think, you know, we, we the, the, the forces of uh, that believe in liberty uh, could, pr could prevail in, in, in 2020. So I think people overread the election of Donald Trump. Donald Trump won. People read it. What's, what's the story you hear? The story you hear is he won by um, uh, speaking to the resentment of white working class, less educated men. That's how he won. He, he, and he, he, he got them riled up, and that's how he won. Wrong. Uh, the white working class, uh, you know, less educated population has voted for the Republican presidential candidate in the same numbers for the last 20 years. They voted for Romney, and they voted for McCain in the same numbers as they voted for Trump. In fact, the, the, the Trump got the same vote generally as Romney and McCain. He didn't get some huge resurgence of white supremacist you know, uh, 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 voters. He got the same voters that the Republican presidential candidate always gets. He still lost the election, the popular vote, by three million votes. He won because the electoral college is screwed up. Uh, but he also won because Democrats didn't turn out for Hillary Clinton the way they turned out for Barack Obama. So, so, so Trump, Romney and McCain got the same number of votes as, as, as Trump got, but Democrats came out in three million more voters for Obama in both 2008 and 2012 than they did for Hillary Clinton in 2016. So it's not so much that there's been some rise in conservative, you know, uh, energy as there was a decrease in liberal energy. And I think a lot of that 
I mean, it's complicated. There are many factors, obviously, always, that explain these things. But one was, one big one was, everybody knew Hillary was going to win. And so if you know Hillary's going to win, if you're kind of turned off to Hillary because, you know, either you don't like the fact that she cozies up to Goldman Sachs or you don't like the fact that she's part of a dynasty or you don't like the fact that uh, she's kind of wooden on stage or you liked Bernie Sanders and she's no Bernie Sanders, you just stay home. And that's how Trump won, because Democrats stayed home. That will not happen again. This engagement that we have seen from the Women's March forward, and I think we will see on Tuesday, although I hesitate to <laughs> predict anything this close in time. I'll predict something in 2020 because you won't remember in 2020 that I predicted it, but, this is but Tuesday <laughs> you, you could remember. But I, you know, I think that will translate into turnout. Obama was a great inspiration to uh, people on the left to vote, but Trump is probably a better inspiration at a time when you think there's actually a chance that he could win. So, uh, so, so, um, so, I, you know, so yes, we're divided, but I think there are actually more people who care about basic rights and values. Trump came in with the lowest approval rating of any president in the history of the United States, and his approval rating has never, it's basically gone between 35% and 41%, despite presiding over the strongest economy in about 40 years. Um, so, you know, if you have a strong economy behind you, you should be up in the 70s, and he's in the 35 to 40. So I, I remain hopeful, as, as Philippe knows, uh, because I think, you know, I think we have the numbers, and I think that is where the country is, and we just give more attention uh, to, the, to that other side because they lucked out uh, in, in getting their president elected. Okay. Africa I mean, and you the just heard why system. we call him once a week <laughs> to basically <laughs> feel better. We feel better about life when we, when we hear from him. I mean, Africa, I'm doing a lot of work now with a number of African countries. I mentioned the Chagos case. It was extraordinary to be at the International Court of Justice and for the first time in history of the court, the African Union spoke with a single voice for the entire African continent. That had never happened before. I mean, it was an issue of decolonization. It's an issue that is of great importance, obviously. But that was a signal, I think, of commitment to that multilateral order, which includes the idea of a rules-based system with a court to dispense justice. But if you talk to leaders in African countries individually, they are, of course, rightly deeply concerned about a crumbling of a multilateral order which could allow them to be picked off one by one with little arrangements, a little bit of money here to do this, that, or the other, which is, of course, not the way it's happened between Europe and the African continent since the EU came into being, which I think has strengthened the hand in a very positive way for the African continent as a whole. If I were advising an African leader, or if I was an African leader, I would be deeply worried about what the collapse of the WTO or the UN system or multilateral rules on investor state protection, for example, might herald. And parts of Africa have some experience of that because China has, over the past 10 years, as I'm sure you know, arrived in Africa and offered rather attractive, in financial terms, propositions, many of which have been signed up on. We'll build roads, we'll build railways, sign on the bottom dotted line. But some of those are beginning to wobble uh, a little bit. And if you speak to African leaders and economic advisors and legal advisors, they will say, we need to hang together as we negotiate in this very, very complex world. So it's a moment of tremendous anxiety. I, I'm hearing you 100%. I've seen it for myself. Mm. Tremendous anxiety. Well, the biggest beneficiaries of a rules-based system are small states. Mm. It's always been that way. Okay, let me take some more questions. Gentleman here, gentleman there, and I'll take the woman in the back, and then I'll come back to you. Don't worry, we've still got some time. Hi. Um, I've got a question about the relationship between liberalism and democracy, which I've basically stolen from Yasha Monk, the Harvard professor. Um, so he argues that, obviously, 
anti-liberal populism is on the rise on one hand, but also we've seen a rise of liberalism without much democracy on the other. And you can look at things like, things you guys have cited like the TTIP, the WTO, the European Union. There's legitimate concerns about all of them, even if you like them all. And there's a risk if we end up just defending those things, we become calcified and blind to their flaws. On the other hand, you've talked about going to the country of parliament can't decide. You've talked about you know, the need to pressure the Supreme Court. There's a risk of ending up just as populist as the right there. So how do we keep liberalism and democracy and keep them together rather than seeing them diverge? Okay, gentleman here. Yes, hi, my name is Jonathan uh, Friedman. I am a um, partner at a due diligence and public risk consultancy and a, a proud supporter of the ACLU. <laughs> um, I um, sent in my absentee ballots last week for the great state of Florida. And you've been talking <laughs> a lot about uh, voter turnout. And I know the ACLU is a big supporter of early voting. Um, one thing that I haven't heard spoken much about, which I find quite strange, um, you know, we see voter turnout tends to skew uh, older and more wealthy. Um, and we also have um, our elections on Tuesdays. Uh, the UK <coughs> has it on Thursdays. Most countries uh, have it on Sundays or Saturdays, which makes to me a lot more sense. Um, otherwise, you're clearly <laughs> discriminating against you know, working folks. Um, I'm curious if the ACLU has a stance on this, if you have a view on this, if there's anything um, to be done on this issue and either have it uh, as a holiday so everyone has equal access uh, or uh, on a weekend. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. And there's a lady in the back. Hi, I'm Danny Duran. I'm a King's College student. Uh, my question's more on like polarization. So one of the go-to arguments Trump supporters have is that they voted for him because liberals were oppressing like more conservative thoughts, often violently, as we're seeing now. Um, following your response on like why Trump won, to what extent do you think that's true? And if so, is there any way to like overcome the polarization that's going on in the U.S. and the U.K.? Okay, big question. Start with you, David, and then Philippe. On. Boy, I'm going to leave liberalism and democracy to Philippe. Yeah, exactly. Easy question. <laughs> a modest question. <laughs> um, uh, you know, I, we are we are uh, as I as I indicated earlier, um, voting rights has been one of our uh, we, one of our central priorities for a long time, and it's uh, all about access to the vote uh, and uh, fighting for uh, early voting for longer hours for more polling places, for easier registration, for automatic registration. Uh, I like the idea of having uh, a, you know, the election day be on a weekend. I don't think it has to be on a Tuesday. Um, I also like the idea of making voting mandatory, which you know, I don't know if the ACLU would like that idea, but I like that idea. <laughs> um, you know, in the same way that jury service is mandatory in the United States, it's part of being a citizen. You don't get thrown in jail if you don't show up to jury, but you know there's a more of a sense that it's an obligation. Um, you know, but but the reality is that given the demographics of the country, any proposal to increase access to the vote will be will be um, opposed by the Republican Party. That's the reality, and so it's very difficult to. Um, uh, to win those battles in red states. States control many of these uh, um, access to vote uh, rules uh, and the like. But, um, but yeah, it's crazy. I mean, I think it's, I also think it's a, a long term, a disastrous strategy for a party to sort of put its, you know, its, its uh, eggs in the basket of stopping people from voting in a democracy. Um, I, I just think that's not, in the long term, that's not likely to be very uh, successful. Um, you know, on, on, on whether Trump's election was in response to people's resentment towards liberals and, and the, the um, uh, d division within the United States, you know, I, 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 think, I think, as I said before, I think the real explanation for his victory, at least in the United States, is Democrats not turning out rather than some resurgence in Republicans turning out. That said, 
it is remarkable, given the way he has acted, that he has retained the support that he has retained. And I think that's because he is playing into that sense of resentment. And uh, Democrats, I think, understand better than they did before that they need to speak to that resentment. They need to, um, um, uh, to address it in a, in a way that is not seen as you know, addressing the interests of people of color, but not the interests of, uh, of poor white people. Um, and, and that's a caricature, but that's um, how it is sometimes, uh, uh, sometimes seen. I mean, the last question I just want to follow on, because of course your question goes equally to Brexit. I mean, what, what really happened here? And, and, and it, it's, I think, a very complex question. Um, people voted, uh, however they voted, on the basis of inadequate information. It's, we've spent two years debating all of the issues, and it's an interesting question as to what would happen if there were to be another vote. There may be another vote, either in the form of a general election or a second referendum. You know, if you're in favor of Brexit, it's very easy to turn around and say, oh, what a bunch of idiots, why on earth do they do that? But that's not the position that I take. It's plain that something has gone very wrong in the United Kingdom. The people who voted in large numbers for Brexit are not wholly irrational people. Many of them formed the view, this connects actually to the first question, that this system that has been created WTO, GATT, European Union, globalization, has not delivered for them. I don't know how many of you here are students from abroad based at the LSE or King's or, or other colleges. <coughs> Go around the United Kingdom. Travel to the Northeast. Go to Cornwall, and you will see poverty. That is astonishing. London is not the United Kingdom. And if people in those areas <coughs> voted as they did, they did so for a, a reason. It is not going to be assisted, ironically, by leaving the European Union. That is the tragedy of what is happening. It is going to be exacerbated, because the kind of free trade rules <coughs> that A.M. Fox and Michael Gove and others want, and some whose name I cannot even bear to mention, <laughs> is a free trade system which would strip out the protections, minimum protections on labor standards, on environmental standards, on health standards, and so on and so forth. So it comes back, I think, to a sense of well-being, including economic well-being, and a sense that the system has not delivered for us. And that, of course, connects to the very first question. I'm not starry-eyed about free trade agreements, investor state agreements, but I look at the alternative. If we're going to have them, and it follows on really from Minush's point, let's at least have multilateral arrangements. Because in multilateral arrangements, groups of less impecunious or well-off or powerful countries can actually come together and on balance, I think, negotiate a better deal. And that is a positive thing. But in thinking about your question, which is, a huge question and cannot possibly be answered in one minute, <laughs> one hour, one day, one week even. I go back to what I've been working on this morning, which is writing a book that focuses, is a sequel to a book I wrote a couple of years ago looking at events in Central Europe and across Europe and Germany and Austria and Ukraine. And I'm looking at Austrian history in 1931. What is the central issue that they are debating in Austria in 1931. It is whether to have a customs union with Germany. Okay? And this tears the country apart because there is the question of national identity and independence. There is the question of whether the poor little Austrian folk are going to be completely subsumed into the engine, economically speaking, of Germany. There is the question of whether the democratic powers of the Austrian parliament can possibly be maintained in the face of a union or an Anschluss with Germany. And the other side says, no, it's the only way we can maintain our stand. I mean, the simple point that I'm making, I don't think we are in a new situation. I think we ignore history at our peril. Nothing is exactly as it was before but we are sort of going round and round in circles. And the great 
challenge I think that we face now, and of course we can't possibly have answers for you, but it's essentially what we've been talking about, is that in the face of the rise of populism in two countries that were on the front lines of militating against it in the 30s and creating a world order in 45 that would prevent it from happening again, how ironic that those two countries now have opened the door to the very thing they sought to take on. And I think that comes back to the fundamental question of whether our institutions are strong enough. And for me, far more important even than democracy, and certainly than liberalism, is the idea of the rule of law. The idea that we have institutions that can function in ways that are effective and broadly respected, which is why the single most shocking thing that I have seen in that regard in the last two or three years is one headline in a newspaper called the Daily Mail a couple of years ago, which for the first time in mm. British history fingered three judges and described them as enemies of the people. That was a line crossed. And when you begin to cross those lines, it's very difficult to roll back uh, the timetable. Okay. I, I, would just, I would just add that I think you know, it goes back to something Philippe mentioned earlier about economic inequality. And, and we are, the UK and the US are uh, deeply, deeply unequal at this point in terms of um, uh, uh, wealth, um, the distribution of wealth. And, and at some point that corrodes democracy and will inspire the kind of populist revolts that we have seen. And I think we've gotten to that point. And the question is whether we can uh, mobilize in, in, a, in a way that responds as the New Deal did uh, when we saw similar kinds of, uh, of concerns expressed about inequality during the, um, during the early 20th century in the United States. So you know, there, I, I, I reviewed a book uh, last year called The Crisis of the Middle Class Constitution, which essentially argued that you cannot have a constitutional democracy without a certain amount of um, of equity and equality among the people. And, we, and, and yet, liberalism allows for uh, this kind of, uh, of, of gross disparity that then corrodes democracy. So, uh, so I think we have, to, we have to get at that. Uh, uh, and, and, and that's why I hope the Democrats will do that. Um, but it's, you know, it's a global problem, not just an American problem or a UK problem. Okay, you've been very patient. I'll come to you, uh, the woman behind you, and the gentleman back there. And I will come, if there's a question at the top, I'll come to you in the next round. Thank you. The question is for David Cole. I'm one European who doesn't vote here nor in the US, but I do support the ACLU with some dollars each month. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm one of the millions that joined after Trump. Um, the question is not related to 701 or FISA, but it's in general. Uh, it would appear that the Americans have the idea that Americans are first-class human beings and everybody else is a second-class human being, could be sent to Guantanamo, could be strangled like a shogi, or could be whatever. And I wonder if that doesn't favor the us versus them that Trump is doing, that anybody who tries to come into the US is an enemy of the people and we need to put the National Guard and everything else. And, and I wonder why the ACLU is not defending human rights as opposed to just American rights. Okay. Lady behind you. And then there was a gentleman over there in the white shirt. Hi, my name's Hannah. I'm studying social and public policy here at the LSC, but I'm from the States. And so as educators, I'm just interested in hearing your advice to, to all of us that are sort of studying in this area. What do you, where do you think that, wh where should we be focusing our efforts as we sort of move forward on our career paths and where can we be making the greatest impact, especially when lots of people are telling us that it's hard to make an impact, don't take a salary cut, you know, where should we be focusing our efforts? Okay. And the gentleman behind me, the white shirt, I think, did you have a... Do you have a question? Yeah. Uh, hi, my name is David Williams, and my question is to do with liberty and democracy and when they can sometimes clash. So you've talked about liberties being eroded in the US by Trump uh, when it comes to migration, sexual health law, and the like. 
what do we do when, and obviously in the US and here with Brexit, we've seen that there might, uh, well, very possibly, be uh, electoral frauds or things have gone wrong, or as you said, the electoral college is screwed up. What happens when people who are talking about getting rid of basic human rights win democratically in legitimate ways? And what's, what's the response to that? Do we go with democracy? When, when, when do we stand against democracy, I suppose? Okay. Oh my gosh. Yeah, these are all easy. Uh, Welcome to the ARC. Yeah. This is my daily life. So, you, the, <laughs> so the ACLU protects uh, human rights as well as Americans' rights. We have a human rights project uh, in, the, in the national office. Um, we use human rights strategies when they are useful. Right now, they're not terribly useful with an administration that care, could care less about human rights. They were quite useful, and, um, and we, we and many others uh, deployed them, I think, quite effectively in pushing back against George Bush and the war on terror uh, and invoking the, the, the c condemnation of many other countries, including countries in Europe, uh, to put pressure on the administration to respect human rights. But we, we believe in uh, uh, human rights. Um, uh, in terms of... Um, when we elect people who uh, are demagogues, uh, you know, I think we have, to, we have to engage politically to push back. That's, that's, that is the, that, that's the, to me, that's the principal response. A secondary response uh, is we rely on the courts and the Constitution, which is not subject to mere majoritarian uh, electoral decision making as a bulwark. And so, you know, we have sued the president uh, on, on, on many things, and the courts, as I said before, have thus far ruled against him on many things and held back some of the worst things that he has done. Whether that will continue, um, we will see. But I, I think you just have to keep, I don't think you give up on democracy. I, I, I just don't think you give up on democracy. And then, in terms of your career, uh, you know, I feel like I am, uh, an incredibly lucky person because I have been able to spend every day of my career uh, as a lawyer uh, since I graduated law school fighting for things I believe in. Uh, and that is a tremendous privilege. And I don't get paid as much as many of my classmates who went to f law firms and um, represented uh, businesses and, and, and the like. And, um, but I feel lucky. Uh, and, and I feel, you know, this is what you, what you spend your life doing uh, as, as, a, as a job uh, is, you know, other than your family, the most important decision you will ever make. And so, you know, to be, dr to be driven by, by, you know, monetary incentives seems foolish when you can get so much more and make so much more of a difference. And there are many, many ways to make a difference. There are many, many ways that one can fight for justice. But, you know, I think at the end of the day, you have to fight for justice. Okay. I mean, on, the, on the human rights question, you need to put into the frame also, into the Brexit context, that before Brexit happened, none of them thought would actually happen, Gove and Johnson and all of them. Uh, they were putting all their energies into something called the Human Rights Act. And they wanted to take Britain out of the European Convention on Human Rights and replace it with something that they called a British Bill of Rights. And for two years, I served as one of the eight members of the previous government's commission on a Bill of Rights. And we went around the country. It was really interesting because in Scotland, in Northern Ireland, in Wales, they said to us, oh, you mustn't call it a British Bill of Rights. That's really not acceptable. <laughs> the UK Bill of Rights is okay, but, but British really doesn't work. And we heard, rehearsed all of the arguments about Northern Ireland and soft borders and hard borders and permeability and so on and so forth. And then in 2016, Mrs. May, when she became Prime Minister, said that if she could, she'd like to take the United Kingdom out of the European Convention on Human Rights. Okay, now pause for a moment. This is the country that gave Europe the European Convention on Human Rights. When it was negotiated from 1947-48 onwards, the theory was we'll take our best common law traditions and we'll export them into an international treaty and then we'll get them to sign up to it 
freedom of expression, which we haven't talked about very much. I'm also the president of English Pen, so I care passionately about freedom of expression and First Amendment equivalents. And we'll, 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 we'll export all these brilliant British rights that we've got, and we'll, we won't impose them on everyone else, because we're not allowed to do that anymore, but we'll persuade them that they're right. And lo and behold, the European Convention on Human Rights is adopted, and actually, it's a pretty remarkable instrument. I remember going to one meeting with Tom Bingham, probably the greatest judge of the last 50 years in the United Kingdom, and he took on a whole group of protesters about the European Convention on Human Rights, and he just issued the challenge, tell me one provision you would change. Tell me what you'd add. And they couldn't come up with anything. It's actually a fairly remarkable document. <laughs> but that's what's coming next. After Brexit, the idea will be to take the United Kingdom out of the domain of all these wretched Albanian and former Yugoslavian judges, Romanians <laughs> and others who are just imposing all these horrors on us from Strasbourg. That's part of the agenda of a prime minister who can say of people um, that if you are a citizen of the world, you are a citizen of nowhere. And that is why what's going on in the United Kingdom, although the terms of the debate are different, really do inscribe themselves, I think, in what is happening in the United States. There is a parallelism here that is going on. Look at the contacts of people like Liam Fox and the Home Secretary, Javid, with some of these far-right institutions in the United States. And the plan is, once we've got the UK out of the EU, we'll be able to have a real form of economic liberalism, we'll strip back on the rights, we'll make ourselves a Singapore-style, vibrant trading nation. And that is the agenda. And I think David is right. And what the last general election showed was that a very leftist manifesto put forward by a Labour leader who is not particularly popular nevertheless attracted very big support, and it may be that a turning point is coming. I mean, on your question of what to do, I'm like David. I'm really an optimistic person. And I look around in particular at my children who are university age now and they're fantastic friends. And they have great futures. They're going to do great things, as you are going to do absolutely great things. But one of the things that I look back on, you know, we're of a certain age now, all of us, and we see who are the people of our age, this is really for the students in the room, who wake up in the morning and are basically happy with their lives. <laughs> Okay, and basically think, I really enjoy what I'm doing. I go in, I do this, I do that. And there is sort of a picture that emerges. And the picture that emerges is that those who are less able to determine for themselves their own direction, in other words, to not put too fine a point on it, paid very large sums of money by large and powerful corporations, are actually not the happiest of our friends today. It's really interesting. It's really interesting. So my only advice to you is to try to find something you do in your life that really excites you. It isn't about money. Of course, you need the bare minimum to be able to get through and do the things you need. But to try to find a way to do that which really excites you, that you can imagine in 20 years, in 30 years, in 40 years, you will still possibly be wanting to do. Now, when you're in your 20s coming out into the world, that's a difficult thing to imagine, particularly when at places like LSE and the UCL and, and King's and other places, and Cambridge, and Oxford, vast sums of money are being thrown at you <laughs> to basically devote yourself 18 hours a day, 7-7, 24-7, to basically be part of the machine. Just pause, <laughs> just pause, and ask yourself, perhaps if you're going to do it just for a limited period of time, some of my students say we'll do it for four years, and then we're out, and I'm going to do what I really want to do, pay off my debts, <coughs> get on with life. But it's, it, it, the world is your oyster. The structures <laughs> that we're talking about are going to be there. And if they get undermined a little bit, it's going to be for your generation to repair them, improve them, take them forward for the next generation. So I think it's incredibly important for us to leave you with the feeling that your generation is an incredibly important generation which will have fantastic things to do, and you'll do them brilliantly. And I have one thing to add to what David and Philippe said, which is vote. <laughs>
The UK、Absolutely. and the US would look very different today if、mm. young people had voted in the last set of elections. I have time for one more round of questions, and I think I'll go to the top. There was a woman here and another one there, so I'll take the two of you, and I'll take the gentleman here in the middle.、Uh, hi. hi, my name's Tori. I'm from the states, but I'm doing a master's here in women, peace, and security.、Um, and I was just wondering, David, I agree that we maybe put too much credence in the significance of Trump's election, but I think it's. Undeniable that there was a wave of racism and sexism that either party failed to <clears throat> contend with, and I was wondering what you thought of that, and if you think there's really a strategy out there from anyone to deal with that.、Okay. If you could pass the mic, yeah. Hi, my name is Mackenzie, and I'm a postgraduate student here at LSE.、Um, this might be a bit of a, an America-centric question,、um, but I'm curious、um, how democracy can be effective when we have such extreme gerrymandering. And、um, what will it take for more equitable redistrib- redistribution to occur? Thank you. And gentleman here.、Uh, my name is Sam Rodin. I'm a retired sociologist. My question, primarily directed to Philippe and the Brexit、uh, mess, but it also, I think, applies to the U.S. on <clears throat> the failure of our democratic institutions, the delegitimizing of elections, and specifically, I'd like you to address. The misinformation campaigns that have been prominent in both the UK and the US, the interference by big money, by Russia, etc., etc. How can we regain credibility for our democratic institutions? Philippe, I'll let you take that first, and then yeah, I'll give、wow. David the、I、last mean, word. No, it's、um, it's a huge question. I, I, just as you were asking, and before I was thinking that one of the similarities between The UK and the US right now is you have a Republican majority in the House and the Senate, and you have a conservative sort of little majority, vaguely not quite in the House of House of Parliament and in, in the House of Commons. And one of the things that is striking is that when push comes to shove, in both countries, the individual representatives, senators, members of Parliament will put party. Before country, it, it, I mean, you saw that in the vote for Kavanaugh. We've seen that on some of the votes on the Brexit withdrawal bill, and and in a sense, you can reconfigure the discussion we're having tonight in terms of the nature of democracy and party representative democracy. That these are two countries in which the parties are trying to save themselves and put themselves, if you like, before the well-being of the country. The number of Senators in the U.S. I know less about、um, the House of Representatives and the number of members of Parliament in this country who are willing to say, "Actually, enough's enough. This is really unacceptable," is staggeringly small, and that raises a big question. Today is an interesting day because, as you will know, one of the leaders of the Pro Leave campaign, the largest single donor, I think, is being said in British history. Aaron Banks. It's been announced that he's subject to criminal investigation in relation to. Um, fundings during the election, the referendum campaign, and of course that then fuels questions of the legitimacy of the system. Already, the call, calls have begun. Should we relook again at the vote? Was it? Was it? If it, if it was, if it was not, if it was tainted with illegality, do we have to consider re-examining its legitimacy and its effect? And it, that's a very difficult door. To open, and I think one needs to reflect very carefully. But the broader issue that you're touching on is, in part, a technological issue. I mean, we now are subject to messages, conscious, subliminal, coming from all sorts of places. We notice it. You switch on your computer. You're busy working away. You do a search for something, and 14 advertisements come up, and those advertisements are targeted to you by. Algorithms which have collected the cookies that we have on our computers and calculated what it is I'm likely to wish to purchase in the next seven days. It's really astonishing, and it's actually gone a little bit further. I've heard talk that there are now mechanisms in which conversations you have on your mobile phone will lead to 
advertisements and messages of a political and other nature being communicated to you by reference to that. So we are in a completely different framework from one in which our traditional regulatory system has been able to deal with things like spending limits and, of course, coming to an issue that we've both put on the table and which all three of us care about very much, freedom of expression. I find myself, as president of English Pen, in a situation of considerable difficulty because, on the one hand, I'm a passionate believer in freedom of expression. But at what point does that freedom, is that freedom exploited or abused to communicate by economic, technological, and other means forms of subliminal propaganda that cause me to go in one way rather than another, which raises a very fundamental question. Is our existing framework, not just the substantive rules, First Amendment, Article 10 of the European Convention on Human Rights, but the means we have available to us to determine whether those rules are being applied. Are those institutional frameworks and processes adequate for dealing with the enormity of what it seems that we face? So I just don't have an answer to that question, but it is plain that we have entered a different space and legal and institutional frameworks that were created largely in the 19th and 20th centuries may require very, very considerable rethinking. One of the ways that thinking has been going in the international domain, which is interesting, is to move areas of criminal liability and responsibility beyond the human person into the corporate person and to put on the agenda. Uh, and that is happening in one area in which I work, in which the uh, UN's International Law Commission <coughs> is now putting forward a draft convention for the prevention and punishment of crimes against humanity. It doesn't exist. There is a convention on the prevention and punishment of genocide, which is concerned with the killing of groups, but there is no equivalent in relation to the protection of individuals. And last week in London, the rapport, special rapporteur who's drafting that and taking that through said he was quite surprised that the entire membership of the International Law Commission now wanted to put corporate criminal liability onto the international domain as a way, if you like, of, I think, beginning to address that kind of issue. But it's a hugely complex question. Okay. David, last word from So I, I would just say that the technological issues that Philippe is adverting to uh, also, I think, very much affect both your question about uh, the rise in, in, in racism and, and, and sexism, or at least in its uh, appearance on the surface, uh, and the question about gerrymandering, because uh, technology, I think, is at the heart of both of those phenomena. Um, it used to be that if you were a white supremacist, um, social norms were such that it was very hard to find other white supremacists. You couldn't go down to the local pub and say, you know, are you a white supremacist? Uh, because you would get beaten up, you would get condemned. Uh, the social norms are very powerful against white supremacy and against misogyny. Uh, and, and so, um, and they operated fairly effectively. Uh, they don't operate uh, on, on social media. They don't operate on the internet. So you can sit in your basement and you can, uh, you know, find like-minded people around the world who share your uh, views without facing the risk of the social opprobrium that those views occasion when they are brought out uh, in public. Um, you know, I, they're still, uh, they still uh, trigger tremendous opprobrium when they are brought out in public, and I think at the end of the day we have to fight back against them by appealing to the notion of equality and doing so in a way that does not uh, fall into a, a, a politics of, of identity. Uh, and the same thing on gerrymandering. It is gerrymandering has been around for a long time, uh, but technology has made it so much more effective. Uh, and it's in part because of what Philippe was talking about. They not only know what you're going to buy next week, but they know who you're going to vote for. And if you know who everyone's going to vote for uh, because of you know, the various uh, data that, uh, that is collected, it's a lot easier to, to uh, construct the districts 
in ways that ensure that rather than the citizens choosing their representatives, the representatives choose their citizens. Uh, and, and, uh, but, I, but there is growing, um, a growing consensus in the United States that that is a problem. Uh, and there have been a number of, uh, of, of um, responses to it by bypassing the legislature, which of course loves gerrymandering, um, uh, and creating independent commissions uh, through referent ballot initiatives. And they've, they've passed in, in, in red states uh, uh, like Arizona. Uh, so, uh, and, and they're on the ballot again in a number of states for the midterm. So I think uh, reform is needed in both of these areas, but I think it's really dealing with uh, the, the way in which technology has vastly changed our world in just the last decade. Okay. David, Philippe. Thank you for making us worry, making us think, but also giving us hope. Thanks to both of you for coming this evening. Thank you to the LSE Law Department for organizing this. And thanks to all of you for coming this evening. Let's give them a round.